Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here. I'm glad you could all join us here in worship. Uh, I want to pray before we uh, get started, and then we'll get right into the text. God, thank you for letting us all be able to join here together and worship you and have fellowship with each other. God, I pray you be with this message. I pray that your spirit is in these words and that whatever they, the, uh, whatever anyone hears is not my words, but is yours. God, I pray that you speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Today our text will be in Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to go on and turn there, we'll start reading there in just a second. An anonymous poet once wrote, When glory was absent and torment plentiful, the plan for love was set in action. For love and life had been made sinful, but the cost of love was satisfaction. This poem speaks to something that's clear in all the lives we lead. Um, We see pain and chaos everywhere, torment and destruction. Maybe we look across the world and we see wars raging with seemingly no end in sight. Maybe we look local and we see political wars dividing us all. Perhaps it's even in the church with entire denominations straying away from the faith and the essentials being denied. Love has been forgotten. Life has been made sinful. Maybe we as believers, maybe we feel like exiles, feel like we are cast out from the rest of society. This is what the Israelites would have felt like during the exile. The Babylonians had came and they had taken them from their home. And they were forced to live in a land completely foreign to them. Thousands of lives were affected. And even the people who remained in Israel had to suffer the oppression of the Babylon, Babylonian empire. Our text found in Isaiah 53 speaks to this. It was written to this people group likely to provide comfort to people who were struggling to see God move in amid, amid the chaos, to provide comfort for these people who were struggling to reconcile their faith in a God that had seemingly abandoned them. It was nowhere to be found. The, the, the prophecy promises Israel a redeemer. The servant of the Lord promises that he will arise and provide relief for Israel. The servant of the Lord, it says, will suffer and he will redeem Israel. And likewise, the servant will provide relief for us. The servant will suffer for us and the servant will save us. In fact, this is the primary truth that we pull from today's passage. The suffering servant saves. We find the servant in the, peace, in the person of Jesus. He fulfills his prophecy fully and completely, and he is the servant of the Lord. Our text teaches us two truths about the salvation that we find in the servant. The first truth revealed, is revealed to us in verses 1 through 3. And it's simply that the servant suffered. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 3 read, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53 starts off with a proclamation and with a question. Who has believed what he has heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now this phrase, the arm of the Lord, whenever it's used in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, it's speaking of the physical manifestation of the redemption of God. In this case, it's speaking to the exiles that the Lord will physically redeem them from exile. And then when it relates to us, it's speaking of the, um, the freedom from the oppression of death, of sin. The text then continues on and introduces us to this arm of the Lord, to this manifestation of redemption. And 
the picture it gives us is not very impressive. Verse 2 says that he was like a young plant in dry ground, which isn't something that we would expect from the arm of the Lord, the redemption of the Lord. We would expect him to be like a strong oak in fertile soil, deep roots, unswayable by anything that comes at him. But instead, we get a twig in some sand. And it says that he's not very impressive to look, like, look at either, um, which is, again, nothing we would expect from the physical manifestation of the redemption of God. We think of the kings, Saul and David, who, who were leader, leaders of Israel, great military leaders and kings. Uh, scripture tells us that they looked the part. We, we think of the leaders, Daniel and Joseph, who rose to be in powers of high authority in foreign nations. Scripture tells us that they were well in form. Overall, this isn't about how pretty these people are. It's about the impression that they gave. They gave one of leadership. It inspired people to follow them. In our text here, we see none of that. It's, it's the opposite. We see nothing that inspires confidence in Jesus to be redemption. Verse 3 continues this, suffer, this depiction, and it describes his suffering. It says that men hated him, rejected him, that he was cast out and continuously surrounded by sorrow and grief. We see this in the life of Jesus. In Luke 9, 22, Jesus describes everything that he'll have to endure, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and he must be killed. Jesus suffered. We know that he underwent physical and emotional distress during his time on earth. He, he wept. He bled. He was beaten. He was struck. He was rejected. We know that he was rejected by his hometown because he refused to do more miracles due to their unbelief. He was rejected by his culture, by his religion, the people that should have seen him coming, the scribes and the Pharisees. He was rejected by his friends, abandoned on the night of his crucifixion. And then, and then he was sentenced to the ultimate act of suffering, on a death on a Roman cross, crucifixion, which is the, the Romans had perfected the art of torture through crucifixion. They uh, would hang you up on the cross and leave you to die after having tortured you. Jesus, uh, scripture tells us, he was given 49 lashes. Um, he was beaten with rods. He was mocked. And then he was hung on the cross to die. And often crucifixion victims would die from asphy asphyxiation with uh, their bodies no longer being able to support them on the cross. Even while he was on the cross, Jesus suffered still. They mocked him. They, they called him names. They spat on him. The very people standing next to him were mocking him, saying, you, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. If you really are what you are, do what you say you can do. And despite all this mocking, Jesus stayed there, and he died. He was given a torturous sentence, and he died in his suffering. I can imagine a young boy. Let's call him Daniel. Uh, Daniel, he's short. He's got these huge Coke bottle glasses. Uh, he has really crooked, ro crooked teeth, and uh, he just got braces, so those crooked teeth are now highlighted by shiny wires. Um, he's very short, scrawny, very unimpressive to look at. Uh, and every day as he begins to get ready for school, he starts to dread the day. Because he knows as soon as he gets on the bus, he knows what waits for him. Because every day for the past six years, Daniel has been bullied. This bully, let's call him Ashley. Um, <laughs> he has done everything he can to make Daniel's life miserable. He picks on him, calls him names, pushes him around a bit, steals his lunch money, all the normal bully stuff. But one day, Daniel decides he's had enough. He goes and he tells the teacher, he says, I don't like what Ashley is doing to me. Can you stop it? 
And the teacher just laughs him off, assumes he's making it up for attention, and then says she'll address it. Ashley finds and then at recess he approaches Daniel. He says, why did you go to the teacher? If you had a problem, you should have came to me. We can sort this out. And then Ashley takes a swing at Daniel. The two get in a fight, which escalates until Ashley shoves Daniel into the street. An oncoming car slams on its brakes, but it's too late. The ambulance is called. Ashley is, or Daniel is rushed to the hospital, clinging to his life. Daniel's peers, Ashley, abused him, mistreated him, and he suffered. His teacher ignored the call for help, and Daniel, now broken, mirrors Jesus. Innocent, but bruised, broken, and breathing his last. We in present day have an immense privilege. We know how history played out. We can look back and we can see how Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. We can see Jesus' suffering. We can see everything they did through the Gospels. And where the people who heard the message straight from Jesus rejected him, let us not do so. The text says, who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? That's us. We are fortunate enough to have the arm of the Lord revealed to us. So open up your ears. At school, at Johnson, we have a chapel theme. And this year's chapel theme is let anyone with ears to hear listen. It's from the parable of the sower. That's what I'm going to call you to do. Open your ears. Open your heart. Let God speak to you. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. The rest of the chapter informs our second truth about the salvation that we find in the servant, which is through his suffering, we are saved. Isaiah 53 is sometimes called the first gospel. We've already seen how it describes Jesus and his suffering and his death. And now as we move into the final part of the chapter, we see the gospel message very clearly. Starting with verses 4 to 9, we see this. We see why the servant suffered. Isaiah 53, 4 to 9 reads, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? Stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. People familiar with the church will recognize much of this language. This is the idea of substitution. The servant in this text is seen taking the place of the people, describes all the wrongdoing and all the sin that Israel has done. And instead of the, um, the affliction being on them, the people that committed the sin, the servant steps in and substitute, is substituted for them. He takes the punishment upon himself. This mirrors the message of the gospel, that Jesus, being perfect, having done no wrong, came for us, the ones who utterly deny God, the ones who the ones who continuously sin. He took our punishment upon himself and suffered. In 1 first, in first Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 
Jesus, the righteous, suffered for us, the unrighteous. As I was doing my research for this message, I came across the term substitute kings. I found out that while it wasn't completely common, uh, there are a few recordings of it in ancient Near Eastern uh, societies, especially common with the Hittites, Assyrians, and um, all throughout Mesopotamia. People would receive the designation substitute king. What would happen is a king or other royal official would be given a bad omen by some oracle or something like that. And uh, when this happened, there would be a substitute king that would step in, take the omen or the curse upon themselves, and then because, uh, and then they would be put to death, effectively eliminating the bad omen. Because of this, uh, they were given a king's burial in return for their sacrifice. However, while the substitute king in ancient Near Eastern, uh, in the ancient Near Eastern cultures would die for one individual, the king of all, of all people, Isaiah says in verse 6 that the Lord laid on the suffering servant the iniquity of us all. Jesus took all of our burdens. He took all of our sin. Christ suffered for us because we could not help ourselves. The text says that we are all like sheep. We have all gone astray. Romans 3, chapter 23, or chapter 3, verses 23 to 25 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. There we see the substitution language again, propitiation, the atonement of our sins through the substitution of Jesus. And though Jesus died to pay our debt, he did not stay dead. Chapter 53, verses 10 to 12 read, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong." Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This text speaks as if Jesus is alive. And as we see in Luke chapter 24, verses 5 to 7, he is. This is when the women had gone after the crucifixion, gone to find Jesus' body in the tomb. And then the angel of the Lord says, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day, rise. Jesus rose from the grave, and having been raised, he appeared to his followers and then ascended into heaven, being exalted, where he reigns with the Father now. Through his resurrection, he defeated death. And now the text tells us he makes intercession for us transgressors, guaranteeing our salvation by mediating for us with our heavenly father. This salvation is part of the inheritance of Jesus, which the text states we get through knowing him. Having taken on our sin, we are made clean. The cost of love was paid Because of Jesus' suffering, we are saved. One of the most powerful parts of this story is that through all of the suffering, though it was intense, our Lord said nothing. We are told that the servant was silent like a lamb to the slaughter. Amid his suffering, he was silent. I can remember a few years ago, um, I was invited by a family friend to go and do some chores on their farm. Uh... We, we went and we, we fed the dogs, we fed the horses, we did some repairs in the barn. Uh, and then our friend told me that it was time to slaughter a sheep. 
I had not signed up for this. I did not know what I was getting myself into, but I stuck around because I was interested. So we went over to the field. We selected a sheep that looked like it was ready, and then we brought it away from the flock. We brought it behind the house, and then my friend turned the sheep's head away and slaughtered the sheep. Throughout the entire process, the sheep didn't say a thing. From selecting it, to removing it from the flock, to slaughtering it, the sheep was silent. The gunshot echoed through the mountains, but the sheep said nothing. Now, had he said something, we still would have selected him. There was no saving that sheep. His bleats would not have saved him. His fate was sealed. But the Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus, he had the power of God. He could have opened his mouth and called forth angels to take him off the cross. Those being crucified with him even mocked him to do so, telling him to call forth angels to save him if he really could. But he chose to remain silent and follow through with the plan, for his love knows no bounds. Some traditions hold that on the night of Jesus' temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was struggling with God, when he was so nervous that he, had, that he was sweating blood, some traditions hold that in that moment, Jesus saw every sin that he would die for. Everything I did wrong, everything all of you did wrong. Every single sin that he would die for. Having seen that, if, if this is true, having seen that, he still chose love. I know that I... In, in all of my sin, I'm not even worthy of God's love. He should not have chosen to die for me. And yet he sees all of the sin. He knew what he was doing. He knew how much pain, how much sin, how the wrath, the fullness of the wrath of God would be poured out to him on the cross. And he chose love anyway. For his love knows no bounds. He died the death that we deserve to die. He suffered our suffering as our substitution. And through this suffering, we are saved. The implications of this message are extreme. Like I said at the beginning, many of us look around and we see things. We see brokenness. We see pain. We see hate, and we think that there's nothing that can make it better. Even us believers sometimes think that there's nothing that can really save us. Sometimes we have moments of doubt that pull us further from God. But this text tells us the opposite of that. The truth is, there is one that can save us. And this is Jesus, the suffering servant who suffered for our sins. And because of this, we no longer owe an unpayable debt. Romans says that for the, the wages of sin is death. For our sin, we deserve to pay that price. We deserve to pay the penalty of death. However, Jesus is the one that paid that price. And all we must do is respond to him. Romans 3.25, which we read earlier, speaks of this. It says that we must receive the propitiation through his blood by faith. Jesus has offered us the gift of grace. So let us have faith. Let us trust in him and allow him to cover our costs. That lie I told, Jesus has already paid the, the price. That time I cheated on an exam, Jesus paid the price. When I lost control of my tongue and yelled, Jesus took my punishment. Every day, when I give in to temptation, betray God. Because Jesus paid our debt, we can be made clean and have eternal hope through his suffering, through his death. 
and through his resurrection. Let us believe, may it please God to reveal himself further to us, to have grace on us that we may believe in this servant, in Jesus, to save our souls. Because only Jesus, only the suffering servant saves. The suffering servant saves. Having found this person, this servant in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who himself was perfect, but had far from a perfect life, suffering every affliction and suffering that we deserve, eventually dying on the cross. His suffering and his death were substitutionary, taking our place, taking upon the wrath of God and paying the debt that sin incurs. And then he rose from the dead, and he's now eternally exalted, having defeated death, reigning with the Father, and guaranteeing our salvation by interceding for us. The poem that we read at the beginning of the message, it was only an excerpt. The beginning of a full story. Here's the full poem. When glory was absent and torment plentiful, the plan for love was set in action. For love and life had been made sinful, but the cost of love was satisfaction. A scatter or a humble man in circumstance, still humbler in his guise, ridiculed by suffering and ridiculed by lies. A scattered flock that turned away earned the pain that paved his path. No more could it be held at bay. From endless sins came endless wrath. Crushed and bruised, striped and torn, a silent lamb whose wool was worn. The rest of the flock had turned away, but from his love he could not stray. Suffering to end all suffering and pain to end all pain. Like a fragrant offering, blood poured out like rain. Out of anguish, the bloody fleece made an offering for endless peace. The cost of love was paid in full, now pure as light and white as wool. The cost of love now lifted high, no pain to bear or tears to cry. As surely do I trust the morning sun to rise. Do I trust that the cost of love was death's demise? Through Jesus' suffering, we are saved. Jesus is the cost of love itself. God knew that there was a price to pay for our redemption. He knew that the wages of sin was death. That cost was a sacrifice. That sacrifice was Jesus. Jesus is the cost of love. Jesus is the suffering servant. Jesus, through his suffering, saves. Though the life we live may often feel like torment, that we look around and we see nothing but, but pain and hurt, there's no peace to be found. Though we may feel like outcasts in exile, let us find relief in Jesus as our comfort, our peace, and our salvation. And may we see him as the suffering servant found in Isaiah 53. Because the suffering servant saves. Let us pray. God, Father, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, to die for us, for revealing your redemption to us sinners, for substituting your death for ours. God, we are grateful and we praise you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you paid the cost of love, Jesus. That being that cost yourself, you chose us. God, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.